Hello. In this week's Torah portion, Shoftim, we read, quote, When you draw near to a city to wage war against it, you shall call out to it for peace first. So, we learn that war must be avoided whenever possible. War always means civilian casualties, intentionally or not. So we ask, what is the Jewish view of civilian casualties in war? Obviously, they must be avoided whenever possible. Obvious to us, but usually not to our enemies. But what to do if it is not possible to avoid them? Sadly, this discussion is motivated by current events. The terrorist group Hamas, operating from the Gaza Strip, targets Israeli cities with rockets, trying to kill as many Jews as possible. Israel retaliates by targeting the rockets and their launchers. Hamas protects these rockets with their civilians, forcing Israel to kill civilians to destroy the rockets so they can show the world that Israel is bloodthirsty. Israel warns the civilians by phone, messages, tracts, and warning shots to flee the locations of the targets before they are bombed. Hamas forces them to stay put and die. Israel sometimes cancels the mission or puts its soldiers at greater risk to avoid civilian casualties. Three questions arise in order of controversy. May one kill in self-defense. May one kill civilians inside military targets in war. May one place oneself at greater risk just to reduce enemy civilian casualties. Let us consider the first. May one kill in self-defense. The answer is yes. The basic law of self-defense is laid out in four places in the Talmuds. The Torah has said, if someone comes to kill you, rise early and kill him first. It is not mere permission, but rather a duty, an obligation, even a commandment. If the only way to stop a potential murderer is to kill him, then you must kill him. You may not be a pacifist or a martyr and allow yourself to be killed rather than kill. However, the Talmud adds, if a man can stop a murderer by maiming one of his limbs, but kills him instead, the man is guilty of murder and executed. Now, the potential murderer conjures up an image of a man in his 20s with an evil face running towards you with a knife, but that is not how it's understood. The pursuer, called the Rodef in Hebrew, does not have to be malicious. He is anyone who stands between you and life. Here are three examples. First, the Mishnah says that if the life of a pregnant mother is in danger, abortion is required because the baby becomes a pursuer. Quote, if a woman is in life-threatening labor, one must cut up the child in her womb and bring it out limb by limb because her life comes before the life of the child. But if the greater part of the child has come out, one may not touch it, for one may not sacrifice one person's life for another person's life." Unquote. Nevertheless, again, one must first try to save the mother by, by maiming the fetus, such as by amputating a limb. Second, smothering a child so his crying doesn't reveal the presence of a group pursued by murderers is permitted. This happened during the Holocaust and in Israel. Third, if a besieged group is told, give us so-and-so or we'll kill all of you, we must deliver so-and-so to them. He becomes a pursuer. However, if they do not specify who is to be delivered by them uh, to them, we may not do it. Tosefta adds, quote, but if they are told, give us any one of you or we'll kill all of you, we may not, because it is not up to us to decide who lives and who dies. The second question is, may one kill civilians along with soldiers in war? There is no ancient commentary on causing civilian casualties in a just war. Some interpret that to mean the answer is obvious. Yes, civilians may be killed with soldiers if it is unavoidable in a defensive war. The Talmud notes, quote, Once permission has been granted to an angel to destroy, it does not distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. Unquote. Thus, the default position is that the innocent perish with the guilty. Indeed, before the Exodus, we had to distinguish ourselves from the Egyptians to prevent our firstborn from, from dying. 
Also, Abraham had to ask God to save Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of the righteous in it. It was not an automatic thing. Finally, the Talmud says, kill him first, without adding with no collateral damage. The Maharal of Prague 16th century commentator concludes, quote, the Torah allows war when we are attacked, and in responding, we are allowed to not distinguish between the guilty and the innocent, unquote. However, warning must be given. As mentioned, the Torah says in our portion, when you draw near to a city to wage war against it, you shall call out to it for peace. In commenting, the Midrash tells us, Rav Shmuel Bar Nachman said, what did Joshua do when he was about to enter the Promised Land? He would publish an edict in every place of the land of Canaan he went to conquer, on which he wrote, whoever wants to go, let him go. Whoever wants to make peace with us, let him make peace. And whoever wants to make war, shall make war. The Girgashites vacated and departed from there, and the Holy One, blessed be he, gave them a land as beautiful as their native land, namely Africa. The Gibeonites desired to make peace with Israel, and Joshua made peace with them. However, the 31 Canaanite kings came to battle with Joshua, and the Holy One, blessed be he, caused them to fall." Unquote. Likewise, King Saul advised the Kenites to leave their homes to avoid being harmed in the war with Amalek. Quote, and Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, otherwise I might destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites. Unquote. So Saul was prepared to endanger civilians in the course of war, and he was not censured for this. Some may object. What about international law? International law prohibits collective punishments, and we Jews must obey the law of the land. Dina de Malchud Dina. There are two answers. First, the Fourth Geneva Convention, written in 1949, recognizes that civilian casualties on property or property damage may be unavoidable. Article 28. The presence of a civilian may not be used to render certain points or areas immune from military operations. Article 53. Any destruction of property is prohibited, except where it is absolutely necessary for military operations. Second, international law must be followed as practiced, not as written. Rav Moshe Feinstein argues that the obligation to obey the law of the land applies to the law as it is practiced, not as it is written. For example, if the law says that the speed limit is 60 miles per hour, but only 65 miles per hour is enforced, Jews may drive close to 50, 65. The United States has had to cause thousands of civilian casualties in many conflicts. It also used mutual assured destruction, the threat of massive collateral, uh, collective punishments, to deter a Soviet nuclear attack during the Cold War. This does not mean we do not care. We do care. The Midrash notes that after Abraham fought against the four aggressor kings and won, he was traumatized by the fact that he had to kill so many people. However, he expressed his anguish only after the war. Before and during the war, he focused on doing what he had to do to win the war. In modern times, many analysts have observed that no one ever took as much care to avoid civilian casualties as the state of Israel does. If war had to be carried out without civilian casualties, or not at all, no country would be able to defend itself and aggression would be rewarded. Also, it must be noted that many civilians are not innocent. Contemporary Rabbi David Sampson writes, quote, When the father of a young suicide bomber proudly holds up his son's picture and says, I am honored that my son murdered Jews, is he an innocent civilian? When the mother of a 17-year-old girl who blew herself up in a crowded Jerusalem market says that she wishes all of her children would grow up to be suicide bombers. Is she an innocent civilian? In the same vein, contemporary rabbi Shaul Israeli writes, Every community is responsible for uprooting its murderers. If a community is against the terrorists among them, but does nothing out of fear, they must not be harmed to the extent possible during an attack. However, if the community encourages terrorism, educates their children to hate Jews, and carry out terror, supports the terrorist, 
and agrees with their murderous claim aims, then they too must be considered as part of the enemy. Also, the enemy must feel the pain of war. Some say that if the enemy does not feel the pain of war, that is, the death of loved ones and the destruction of property, he has no incentive to stop his aggression. Our third question is the hardest. May one place oneself at greater risk just to reduce enemy casualties? First, we know that Israel has been doing just that. In 2002, Israel pursued terrorists in Jenin, going house to house to hunt them down, and lost 23 soldiers. They would not have died if Israel had attacked only from the air and caused hundreds of civilian casualties. Second, Hamas and Hez Hezbollah fired tens of thousands of rockets at Israeli cities. Israel could carpet bomb Gaza and southern Lebanon to eliminate the threat, but doesn't, and loses a lot of soldiers in the process. Third, Israel canceled many anti-terrorist missions because their targets were mixed with civilians. Here there is no halakha, Jewish law, to guide us. No halakha exists to require or even permit this. Again, many interpret this to mean the answer is obvious. No. Thus, many rabbis rule that it is forbidden to risk Israeli lives just to spare Arab civilians. However, one must look at the big picture. If it is felt that Arab casualties will later endanger Israeli lives because of Arabs seeking revenge, risking Israeli lives may be permitted. The Talmud says that the ruler is allowed to risk up to one-sixth of his population to secure his nation in war. Quote, Shmuel said, a government who kills only one of his own people out of six by going to war is not punished. Unquote. What do we conclude? First, Jewish law permits killing in self-defense, if that is the only way to stop a murder. Second, Jewish law allows waging a defensive war that causes many enemy casualties, civilian casualties, if they cannot be avoided. However, warning must be given to allow the civilians to flee before the attack. Third, Jewish life may not be put at greater risk to reduce enemy civilian casualties, but account must be taken of enemy reaction. We are not pacifists. We will defend ourselves. World, take notes. Shabbat Shalom.